Okay, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about two short stories, um, Two Kind uh, by Amy Tan will be first, and then The Necklace by Guy de Montpassant will be the second. Um, so again, as we're reading through this, uh, again, I, I recommend that you print them up uh, and that you highlight the things that we talk about. Uh, those are the sorts of things that will be showing up on the final exam. I think in this short story, Two Kinds, um, of the all of the short stories we've read, this most clearly, it seems to me, can be read as a conflict between people, two people. It's not just an inner conflict. It might be read, uh, debatably, but it might be read as a conflict between the mother and the daughter. Let's look at the beginning. My mother believed you could be anything you wanted to be in America. You could open a restaurant. You could work for the government and get a good retirement. You could buy a house with almost no money down. You could become rich. You, become, you can become, or you could become instantly famous. Of course, you can be a prodigy too, my mother told me when I was nine. You can be best at anything. What does Auntie Lindo know? Her daughter, she only best tricky. So there's another, this is actually a collection of stories, part of the Joy Luck Club. And just so if you're wondering what the context is there, uh, there's another girl um, who is a uh, champion chess player. Okay. America were, was where all my mother's hopes lay. She had come here in 1949 after losing everything in China. Her mother and father, her family home, her first husband, and two daughters, twin baby girls. But she never looked back with regret. There were so many ways for things to get better. Okay, so this is the mother who believes in, I guess, what we might call the American dream. You could be anything you wanted to be in America. Okay, and so she ex assumes that her daughter could be some sort of a prodigy, uh, you know, an expert in something. Um, and so at the beginning, you know, trying different things. What is it? You know, she could be the Chinese Shirley Temple or she tries uh, other tests and she's not doing particularly well on those other tests. So they're fishing around trying to find, find out, you know, what her special talent is. And if you look at the last paragraph of this first page, in fact, in the beginning, I was just as excited as my mother, maybe even more so. I pictured this prodigy part of me as many different images, trying each one on for size. I was a dainty ballerina girl standing by the curtains, waiting for her, uh, waiting to hear the right music that would send me floating on my tiptoes. I was like the Christ child lifted out of the straw manger, crying with holy indignity. I was Cinderella stepping from her pumpkin carriage, with sparkly cartoon music filling the air. So she wants to be part of this. She's excited about it. At first, she's, you know, on board and more than on board. She's maybe more excited than even her mother, right? And then top of 385. In all of my imagining, I was filled with the sense that I would soon become perfect. My mother and father would adore me. Okay, so the fact that she wants to be something she's not in something, of course, which is impossible, and that my mother and father would adore me. Maybe at this moment she feels they don't adore her. You know, they don't like her just as she is. I would be beyond reproach, and I would never feel the need to sulk for anything. So clearly she feels the need to sulk. Now, um, maybe if she were perfect, uh, if she found this prodigy side of her, she wouldn't need to sulk, okay? So... Arguably, this is a conflict between the mother and the daughter, but also arguably, it's a conflict, and you know, uh, you, you could choose which one you prefer, between two sides of the daughter, her desire to please her parents and to be perfect and have no reason to sulk, and uh, her desire to be her own person, which flares up too, because of, after all the failures, you know, world capitals and um, different things, that are tested, you know, she's, she's not an instant genius at anything. Uh, skip down uh, maybe two thirds of the way down the page there in 385. And after seeing my mother's disappoint, disappointed face once again, something inside of me began to die. I hated the test, the raised hopes and failed expectations. Before going to bed that night, I looked in the mirror above the bathroom. Uh, sink. And when I saw only my face staring back and that it would always be this ordinary face, I began to cry. So she's looking at herself in the mirror 
and she sees what she takes to be an ordinary face, she, she begins to cry. Such a sad, ugly girl. I made high-pitched noises like a crazed animal trying to scratch out the face in the mirror. Okay, so clearly she's upset, but she's upset with herself, but she's also probably frustrated with the circumstances, frustrated with her mother, her mother's disappointment. Okay, now here's what's important. Remember, she's looking for the prodigy side of her. She's looking for her special form of genius. Look what lands here. And then I saw what seemed to be the prodigy side of me, because I had never seen that face before. I looked at my reflection, blinking so I could see more clearly. The girl staring back at me was angry, powerful. So she's feeling empowered now looking at this girl looking back at her. This girl and I were the same. I had new thoughts, willful thoughts, or rather thoughts filled with lots of won'ts. I won't let her change me, I promised myself. I won't be what I'm not. Okay, so she was on board in the beginning. And somewhere along the line now, this became just her mother uh, wanting her, you know, to discover her prodigy side so she could be, you know, the best at something. Uh, and she was on board, and now clearly she's not on board anymore. And so what is she looking for? Her special genius is what she is, is this ability to rebel. Um, she's looking back at herself. She feels angry but powerful. And she has these new thoughts, these willful thoughts. So her ability to reject her mother's efforts to find her prodigy side of her, that is the prodigy side of her. I won't be what I'm not. Now, we might see this as empowerment, certainly um, an act of resistance, a desire to be her own person. But I think there's a flip side to this too, and that is, is she defining herself by what she won't? She was filled with lots of won'ts, we're told here. And is she defining herself that way? And is that a healthy way to define yourself by all you're not or all you won't, as opposed to all you are or all you might, what you might do? Okay, so think about that. Give that some thought. Uh, I think it's certainly at least ambiguous, you know, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. And perhaps it's, it's both. Okay. Um, let's turn then to, um, so just to be clear, um, she, uh, finally the, the mother um, gets her piano lessons and, you know, does cleaning for the man. Uh, so she's working hard, the mother is, so that her daughter can get uh, piano lessons. Um, and she didn't practice much. Uh, she didn't work very hard at it. And in fact, her music teacher was deaf. And so um, he's not a very good music teacher and he can't, you know, so she could play almost anything and he wouldn't know that she was playing it wrong. And she says at the top here, second complete paragraph on page 388, or actually first complete paragraph on 388. So maybe I never really gave myself a fair chance. I did pick up the basics pretty quickly and I might have become a good pianist at that young age, but I was so determined not to try, not to be anybody different that I learned to play only the most ear-splitting preludes, the most discordant hymns. And so she's thinking, you know, maybe I, not that I was going to be a genius piano player, but maybe I could have been better if I gave myself a chance. You know, I could have been okay, could have been pretty good. But she was so determined not to try. Again, that's her genius, isn't it? Her ability not to and to define herself by lots and lots of wants. Okay. And so, again, is it the conflict between what she imagines her mother wants from her uh, and her, you know, desire not to be that? Okay. Is it this inner conflict or is it a person-to-person -person conflict? And again, I, I, think, it's, I think it's debatable. Um, and so, of course, she uh, she goes to the recital and hadn't practiced enough and completely tanks, right? She does a terrible job and somebody says, oh, that was awful. But she's thinking, oh, well, at least I could quit the piano lessons and, you know, now I don't have to go through this anymore. And the mother says, no, no, you're going to, you know, keep doing this. The mother's not giving up. The mother's holding on. Okay. And so finally, um, I'm on page 390 here, and oh, about three quarters of the way down, and she finally uh, explodes, um, Jing Mei does, and says, you want me to be someone that I'm not, I sobbed, I'll never be the kind of daughter you want me to be. 
Okay, so it's like pushing back. You don't love me the way I am. And so the mother says, only two kinds of daughters, she shouted in Chinese, those who are obedient and those who follow their own mind. Only one kind of daughter can live in this house, obedient daughter. So she's saying, it's sort of going back to, I say so because I'm the mother, right? And it's, it, which is probably not the best possible response to a child. Because I said so, and I'm the mother is not the best uh, best way of uh, winning an argument. Well, it's a good way of shutting down an argument, but not actually, you know, persuading. Uh, then I wish I weren't your daughter. I wish you weren't my mother, I shouted. I, as I said these things, I got scared. It felt like worms and toads and slimy things crawling out of my chest, but it also felt good, as if this awful side of me had surfaced at last. Uh, okay, so again, that sort of, maybe that's part of her genius, is her resistance. Too late, change this, my mother said, or said my mother shrilly. Okay, and then uh, Jingmei goes for the nuclear option. She says the thing, if you love somebody, uh, and you're close to somebody, you always know there's something, and there's at least one thing, probably several things, you would never say because it would be so hurtful that you just, no matter how angry you are, you don't drop the nuclear option, right? But she goes nuclear. She says, and I could sense her anger was rising to the breaking point. I wanted to see it spill over. And that's when I remembered the baby she had lost in China. The one she never talked about. Then I wish I'd never been born, I shouted. I wish I were dead like them. Okay. And that was, that was it. That's that, the, she plays that card, the card you, you know, the nuclear option, the, you never play it, but she does. It was as if I'd said the magic words Alakazam and her face went blank. Her mouth closed, her arms went slack. She backed out of the room, stunned, as if she were blowing away like a small brown leaf, thin, brittle, lifeless. Okay, and so that was how she eventually got her mother to stop trying to get her to be a, a prodigy. Was it the right way of going about it for Jingmei? Was it the right way for the mother to insist upon it? Um, and what is it about her saying these things, I think, shocking to her mother that she would ever say those things? Um, is it that finally made the mother kind of quit and give up? And then years pass. That episode of their lives appears to be over, and now we jump forward in time. It was not the only disappointment my mother felt in me. In the years that followed, I failed her so many times. Now, you know, failed her how? Didn't live up to her, what, ridiculously high expectations? Or failed her in, you know, more minor ways, too? Each time asserting my own will, my right to fall short of expectations, I didn't get straight A's. Well, okay, most people don't get straight A's. I didn't become class president. I didn't get into Stanford. Yeah, most of us don't either. I dropped out of college. Okay, let's take a look at that last one. Not only did she not get straight A's or class president or didn't get into Stanford, that's okay, you know. You don't have to do those things. You don't have to be a prodigy, a genius. But I dropped out of college. Is she doing it because that's what she wants or what's best for her? Or is she still defining herself in terms of wants? In other words, my mother wants me to go to college, wants me to do really well. I'll show her. Okay, and is that what's best for her? For unlike my mother, I did not believe I could be anything I wanted to be. I can only be me. Okay. Um, and so, I, you know, well, that's true, isn't it? We can only be ourselves, but could we be our best versions of ourselves? And maybe that's what the mother really wanted. Uh, years pass and we um, are looking uh, uh, at her and um, about two halfway through the page there um, on page 291. For after our struggle at the piano, she never mentioned my playing again. The lesson stopped. The lid on the piano was closed, shutting out the dust, my misery, and her dreams. So she surprised me a few years ago. So she's an adult now, years later. She offered me the piano for my 30th birthday. I had not played in all those years. I saw the offer as a sign of forgiveness, a tremendous burden removed. As a sign of forgiveness. Okay, so it seems like Jing Mei recognizes that she needs to be forgiven. Okay. Um, and she said, are you sure? You I mean, I, don't you want it? And she says, you're, it's your piano. You're the only one who can play. 
And she said, well, you know, I probably can't anymore. I've been, haven't done it for years. And she said, you'll pick it up fast, said the mother, as if she, she, as if she knew this was certain. You have natural talent. You could have been genius if you want to be. No, I couldn't. You're just not trying, and my mother said my mother. She was not angry, no sad. She said it as if to announce the fact that it never, that could never be disproved. Take it, she said. So you, you just weren't trying hard enough. And so maybe, you know, and sometimes this happens too, is that we remember things differently. We remember things different from the way that our uh, parents or caregivers uh, remember things. Um, maybe the mother doesn't remember or didn't recognize how much the struggle was uh, hurtful to Jingmei, so much so that she had to find in her genius side her uh, willingness to rebel. But maybe Jingmei was wrong too in not understanding what it is that her mother really wanted from her, and that was maybe not to be a genius or a prodigy, but just to try her best. And Jingmei didn't uh, as a child, and maybe hasn't for the rest of her life too, until she's 30. Um, and so she goes over to, uh, she goes to play the piano, and she sees two pieces. I opened up the Schumann book to the dark little piece I had played uh, at the recital. It was on the left-hand page, Pleading Child. It looked more difficult than I remembered. I played a few bars, surprised at how easily the notes came back to me. And for the first time, or so it seemed, I noticed the piece on the right-hand side. It was called Perfectly Contented. I tried to play this one as well. It had a lighter melody with the same flowing rhythm and turned out to be quite easy. Pleading Child was shorter but slower. Perfectly Contented was longer but faster. And after I played them both a few times, I realized they were two halves of the same song. So essentially, you know, different versions of the same song. Um, I, I've asked students in the past what they've made of this, and they've had come up with some wonderful interpretations and interesting interpretations of what this means. I will offer one as a possibility. Uh, pleading child was shorter but slower. Um, that's childhood. Childhood is short. It goes by very fast except for, for the child. Childhood seems very slow and the older you get the more time seems to go faster and faster and you recognize childhood is a very short period of your life. Um, but it seems to take forever when you're there. Perfectly contented was longer, but faster. Perhaps that's the rest of our lives, okay? And so maybe the pleading child that she was, it was short and slow, leads to the perfectly contented person she is now. It's life, it's longer, your adult life is longer, and it goes by faster. And in some ways, the two halves of the same song might be a way of saying, it was the, um, um, the difficulties of her childhood when she was a pleading child asking to kind of be set free from her mother's dream. That led to the person she is now. And maybe she's very comfortable in her own skin. Maybe she is perfectly contented with who she is and who she became. And if so, I think that that's a positive. Okay, so let's go to the next story, The Necklace by Guy de Montpassant. Okay, so let's take a look at the necklace. Guy de Maupassant, he was a 19th century French writer. So what we're reading here is in um, translation. Um, let's just take it from the beginning. She was one of those pretty charming young ladies born as if through an error of destiny into a family of clerks. Okay, so middle class to lower middle class. She was born into, you know, some of the worker bees of the world as if um, she was a pretty charming young lady and so maybe it was a mistake of destiny that she was born into, you know, the working class, the, the white collar uh, workers, but lower white collar uh, workers. She had no dowry, no hopes, no means of becoming known, appreciated, loved, and married by a man, uh, either rich or distinguished. And she allowed herself to marry a petty clerk in the office of the Board of Education. So she not she met the love of her life and married him. She allowed herself to be married, uh, to marry this man, right? She was simple, not being able to adorn herself, but she was unhappy as one out of her class. She was unhappy because she should be in a different class. She should be uh, able to 
to you know dress more beautifully to adorn herself better okay so she feels like she or whatever some sort of birthright that she is better than uh what her circumstances suggest um for women belong to no caste no race their grace their beauty and their charm serving them in place of birth and family at least that's from her point of view um i am attractive enough uh and uh, gracious and graceful enough i suppose that i belong in a different class and yet here i am married to this um clerk their inborn uh, finesse, their instinctive elegance, their suppleness of wit are their only aristocracy, making some daughters of the people the equal of great ladies. Okay, again, that's from her perspective, okay? Because otherwise, if that were true, then uh, she would have married an aristocrat. Huh. Okay, she suffered uh, incessantly. That means always, constantly. She suffered incessantly, feeling herself born for all delicacies and luxuries. She suffered from the poverty of her apartment, the shabby walls, the worn chairs, and the faded stuffs. All these things, which another woman of her station would not have noticed, tortured and angered her. So, she, you know, everything's not perfect. Things look maybe a little run down, a little shabby, a little worn. These things torture her. Um, and angered her. The sights of the little Breton, that would be her husband, who made this humble home, awoke in her sad regrets and desperate dreams. Okay, and so I think the conflict is pretty clear, isn't it? That she looks at herself in the mirror and she, she imagines that she belongs living a much more luxurious, uh, fancy, uh, aristocratic sort of lifestyle. And she was born into a uh, family of workers, worker bees, uh, office workers, clerks, and uh, and she married one too, uh, who's not in, in, you know, he's not in any great position. He's a petty clerk in an office of the Board of Education. So it's sort of the, the conflict between what she wants, what she desires, and the reality of her circumstances, okay? Um, and so uh, she, we have this person who is always going to be miserable, you know, because she can't, we think, because she can't uh, sort of break through and live the life that she um, uh, wants to live. We find out um, about uh, second, her first complete paragraph there, maybe about six or seven lines from the top. She had neither frocks nor jewels, nothing, and she loved only those things. Okay, so she can only love the things she doesn't. She doesn't love her husband. She doesn't love what she has. She loves only those things she doesn't have, which is, you know, dresses and, and jewelry. She felt she had been, she was made for them. She had such a desire to please, that's almost certainly ironic, maybe please the right kind of people, to be sought after, to be clever and courted. Okay. She had a rich friend, a schoolmate at the convent whom she did not like to visit she suffered so much when she returned and she wept for whole days from chagrin from regret and from despair and disappointment so she'd go to her friend who's doing a lot better a rich friend and it would make her cry and make her very sad so the husband wants to please her as much as possible and so he you know sort of finagles a um an invitation to this fancy uh, ball and her first reaction is i don't have anything to wear give it to uh, maybe a colleague whose wife is better fitted out than I. Ouch, that hurts. And so uh, he had saved up money to buy a hunting rifle, and he gives that to her, and she buys a dress. And is she satisfied? No, uh, of course not, because now she doesn't have any jewels to wear. Um, and then she thinks, or her husband thinks, why don't you go... Um, Ask your friend, your rich friend, maybe she has something. And she's, so she, she goes to see Madame Forestier. Um, about halfway down the page, um, she saw, so she, she's saying, Madame Forestier says, sure, sure, you can borrow something. Just go ahead and, and choose, take a look. She saw at first some bracelets, then a collar of pearls, then a Venetian cross of gold and jewels and of admirable workmanship. She tried the jewels before the glass, hesitated, she could not neither decide to take them nor leave them. Then she asks, have you nothing more? Okay, so even with these wonderful jewels, it's, do you have something else? 
Why, yes, look for yourself. I do not know what will please you. Suddenly she discovered in a black satin box a superb necklace of diamonds, and her heart beat fast with an immoderate desire. Her hands trembled as she took them up. She placed them above her throat against her dress and remained in ecstasy before them. Then she says, you know, can I, could you lend me this? Oh yeah, certainly, whatever. Okay, um, and of course the irony at this moment, which we only realize later, is the thing that she selected as the most beautiful and the most perfect were fake, right? And I think it's significant. She thinks that she's born for all these great things and these beautiful things, and what she ultimately selects is fake. But I would also suggest to you, and I think this is part of the double irony that Montpassant loves, is that even if they were real diamonds, they shouldn't uh, really mean anything, right? Um, they're rare, fair enough, but they shouldn't signify that what kind of person she is just because she's you know, wearing it. But for her, the, the glass diamond, um, uh, or these fake diamonds, um, are the most beautiful of all. And so if she sees a person wearing beautiful diamonds and she wants to be like an aristocratic woman wearing beautiful diamonds, maybe she sees one walking down the street, um, those might very well be fake diamonds and she wouldn't know the difference. Okay, and oh, what a night she had, bottom of the page there. She danced with enthusiasm, with passion, intoxicated with pleasure, thinking of nothing in the triumph of her beauty, in the glory of her success, in the kind of cloud of happiness that came uh, of all this homage and all this affirmation, admiration and all of these awakened desires and this victory so complete and sweet to the heart of a of woman. Awakened desires. Okay, so this is, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. This husband is not going to be able to, uh, this is not a repeat engagement. This isn't, oh, let's do this once a month. Um, this is a one-time deal, and it's awakened in her these desires. Um, or, because I think the desires have already been there, sort of maybe clarified for her the nature of her desires. This is what she wants. And, of course, she's going to have to go back to her old life. Um, and we find out that she lives on a street called Martyr Street. Um, and uh, right here, maybe about... 16, 17 lines from the top. It took them as far as their door to Martyr Street, and they went up wearily to their apartment. It was all over for her. And on his part, he remembered that he would have to be uh, at the office by 10 o'clock. Okay, and so that's it. Party's over. And then, of course, she realizes, oh, lost the necklace somewhere it went, and um, they can't find it, so they have to borrow a bunch of money. Um, and they have to move. They have to live much more frugally. And um, they borrow money, they buy a new necklace, and they replace it. They don't tell um, Madame Forstier that, uh, that she lost the original. Okay. Um, let's look now on page 176. Uh, Madame Loiselle now knew the horrible life of necessity there, two-thirds of the way down the page. She did her part, however, completely, heroically. It was necessary to pay this frightful debt. She would pay it. They sent away the maid. <clears throat> Wait a minute, excuse me? Uh, when she was so upset and living in that shabby apartment of hers, they had a maid? Okay, I didn't get that sense. Uh, they changed their lodgings. They rented some rooms under a mansard roof. Okay, so they not as nice a place, kind of almost like an attic space. She learned the heavy cares of a household, the odious work of a kitchen. She washed the dishes. Um, yeah, so do you and I, right? Using her rosy nails upon the greasy pots and the bottoms of the stew pans. She washed the soiled linen, the chemises, the dishcloths, which hung on the line to dry. So she did, I mean, it's not as easy as it is today, but she did the laundry. Okay. Um... She took down the refuse to the streets, so she had to take out the garbage each morning and brought up the water, stopping at each landing to breathe. Okay, well, luckily we have indoor plumbing now. And clothed like a woman of the people, she went to the grocers, the butchers, and the fruitiers with her basket on her arm, shopping, haggling to the last sou, her miserable money. Okay, so I think <laughs> what we're getting a picture here is we're talking about how horrible her life of necessity uh, is called. But I think what you and I would say is 
Uh, this is, you know, it's, it's harder to do than it is for you and I, but this is kind of what we all do. We all wash our dishes, we do our laundry, we take out the garbage. Uh, we, we, I don't know about you, I don't have a maid. Uh, we do our own cleaning, right? Um, and so for her, what uh, looking around her room, which looked kind of shabby, you know, I guess everything is uh, a matter of perspective, isn't it? Um, that now she has to live a life which <laughs> doesn't sound too different from what most of us must do. I guess somebody else used to wash her dishes. Somebody else used to um, take out the trash. Somebody else had to do the laundry. Now she has to do it. Okay. Um, and then they, uh, they work very hard. Uh, eventually, they, years later, are able to pay off the debt. It takes 10 years. And um, they finally did it. They paid off the debt. Okay. And then from, uh, top of the page, four lines from the top there. Mademoiselle seemed old now. She had become a strong, hard woman, the crude woman of the poor household. Her hair badly dressed, her skirts awry, her hands red. She spoke in a loud tone, washed the floors in large pails of water. But sometimes when her, father, when her sorry, husband was at the office, she would seat herself before the window and think of that evening party of former times, of that ball where she was so beautiful and so flattered. How would it have been if she had not lost that necklace? Who knows? Who knows? How singular life is and how full of changes. How small a thing will ruin or save one. Okay, so she's looking and she's thinking, oh, if I'd just not lost that, that, that necklace, what would my life have been like? Who knows? Who knows? I know. You know. She was miserable. She was living a miserable life. Uh, she was sad. She was angry. She would visit a friend and come back crying for days. And she had this one ball to go to where she had sort of a vision of uh, a false vision, no doubt, but a vision of other people living other lives. Um, and she would be miserable. She would be miserable. OK, so she thinks, oh, my life could have been something so much better if I had not lost the necklace. No, you would have given the necklace back. And you would have gone on with your life and you would have, you know, been ups upset with the life you were living. And look at that last line. Uh, how small a thing will ruin or save one. Think of that, how a small thing will ruin or save one. I would think that from um, Matilda's, you know, perspective, she thinks that this has ruined her life. But I would say that, no, her life was pretty much ruined. She was unhappy, didn't seem capable of being happy. So maybe losing the necklace actually saves her, not ruins her, but saves her. And in literature, sometimes we have what's called the fortunate fall. In other words, the worst thing that could have ever happened to her maybe turns out to be the best thing that ever happened to her. Okay. And so she's coming along and she's walking along the streets and she sees her old friend. And... Her old friend, you know, she, she walks up to her. Should I say something? Should I tell her? Should I tell her, you know, that we lost the original? You know, why not? And it's kind of interesting because Matilda, the, the earlier Matilda would never have told her that. Okay, so now she's saying, why not? She approached her. Good morning, Janine, or Jean. Her friend did not recognize her and was astonished to be so familiarly addressed by this common personage. She stammered, but madame, I don't know. You must be mistaken. No, I am Matilda Wazel. Her friend uttered a cry of astonishment. Oh, my poor Matilda, how you have changed. Yes, I have had some hard days. Um, I saw you, and um, as, since I saw you, and some miserable ones, and all because of you. Because of me? How is that? You recall the necklace that you loaned me to wear to the minister's ball? Yes, very well. Well, I lost it. How was that since you returned it to me? I return another to you exactly like it, and it has taken us 10 years to pay for it. You can understand that it's not easy for us who has, have nothing, but it is finished, and I am decently content. Decently content. Was Matilda ever, the old Matilda, ever decently content? And I would say no. 
Okay, so maybe losing the necklace is actually sort of a positive. It gave her life some purpose. It's a goal. This is something that has to be done. And she's actually accomplished something with her life. She has repaid this huge debt. And so now she feels decently content, not outrageously happy, uh, but decently content. Uh, uh, but that's a way she never would have been before. Madame Forestier stopped short. She said, you say you bought a necklace to replace mine? Yes, you did not perceive it then. They were just alike. And she smiled with a proud and simple joy. Again, a proud and simple joy. Uh, did the old Matilda ever feel a proud and simple joy? No. Madame Forestier was touched and took both of her hands as she replied, Oh, my poor Matilda, mine were false. They were not worth over 500 francs. Boom, then the story ends there. Okay, now you and I were human beings, and we probably want to know, well, does she get her money back, or what happens now? Uh, you know, her friend, if she's a decent person, will say, here, you know, take your money back, or I'll, you know, I'll take 500 out, but you can have, uh, you can have the diamond back, or, or whatever, okay? But the fact that Montpassant doesn't put that in here isn't because he wants to leave us, I think, in a state of misery. Um, or mystery for that matter. But uh, instead, I think because it's largely irrelevant, okay? Um, if we were to say, look, the conflict is between her desire to, uh, to live a particular sort of life and the reality of her circumstances, if that's the conflict. Um, and th the climax uh, is maybe somewhere along the way um, when she sort of changes her, her realization of you know she feels sort of her attitude towards life that her life has purpose and maybe the climax maybe was losing the necklace that seems to have occurred too early in the story to be the climax maybe it's at this moment when she decides to go up and approach her friend uh she has maybe sort of this realization about herself saying i'm gonna walk up why not what do i care um i'm not i don't look like i used to look uh but i'm just gonna tell her i'm just gonna let her know why not Okay, so maybe there was in there when she saw her friend some sort of an epiphany going on there. But ultimately, we're seeing a Matilda who um, has had 10 hard years, 10 rough years, but who is a person who is happier, more content, feeling proud, simple joy. Um, and so maybe ultimately, what happened to her was the best thing that could have happened to her. Otherwise, we'd be 10 years along. She would have accomplished nothing, and she would just be 10 years more miserable than she was before. Okay, so um, interesting idea. Uh, and so the fact that we're not given this information at the end is, you know, well, now you're rich, uh, Matilda. No, um, that's not what's important. What's important, uh, what's irrelevant is what the, the diamonds were worth. But, or the, the glass was worth, the necklace was worth. But what's more important is that she was able to accomplish something. And maybe in finding purpose and meaning, that's where we find simple joys. We find decent contentment. Okay? All right. Well, uh, don't forget to take the quiz, and we'll see you next time. Bye now.